It's Monday, March 16th, 2020. Digital Trends Live is about to start. Here are some of the topics we're covering on today's episode. I suspect quite a number of people watching this right now are working from home because of coronavirus. We'll bring you up to date on the news as we know it, including some positive developments, like the fact that Uber Eats has waived all fees associated with delivery from independent restaurants, along with a few other things that could be a sign of what's to come as people order delivery more. We'll also be joined by Drew Prindle for another edition of Awesome Tech You Can't Buy Yet, featuring some of the coolest and strangest products he has found a across the crowdfunding spectrum. And the best-selling author and host of PBS's Neil Ferguson's Networld, Neil Ferguson, will join the show to talk about his three-part documentary premiering on March 17th, which focuses on misinformation on social media. Now, it's been a problem that's been around for centuries. All that and more on today's episode of Digital Trends Live. Yes, hello everyone, this is Digital Trends Live, our live show here from Digital Trends, where we broadcast every weekday, 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern, bringing you trending tech headlines, news, interviews, discussions, and so much more. Broadcasting across many different spectrums. We're on Periscope, Twitter, Twitch, Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, Dailymotion, Apple News, two different mobile apps, a smart television app, and at digitaltrends.com slash live. So wherever you're finding us, thank you for joining the show. Hit subscribe, share the show, let other people know about it, because we're gonna keep you up to date on what is happening in tech. And certainly, we have to start off with, obviously, the most resounding news story that we've encountered in quite a long time, and that is coronavirus. And what we're going to do is, as we go through this show, we expect to be broadcasting here every weekday. I know a lot of people are watching from home right now as things shift and change. I mean, really, the stories are updating by the minute, um, if not even faster than that. And so we'll try to keep the update with what we know. Um, but as all these closures are happening, just a little bit of an update on that. Uh, we know that uh, New York, Connecticut, and I believe New Jersey are all shutting down bars and restaurants, places of work are changing up to where a lot of people are working from home. And um, there's some things that are associated with that that we wanted to talk about just as far as the tech side of that spectrum. We are broadcasting live. We can take your comments and questions as we go throughout the show as well. Uh, so something that's pretty important on this as we see this shift of, of a lot of places shutting down schools, um, a lot of places where now kids are at home, they're trying to change over education to go to an online platform and doing that overnight is very, very difficult. We do know of some efforts that are being underway right now in New York to try to do just that. And for the teachers out there, this is, this is hard to switch to all online. It changes up everything that we're doing, but it's what's necessary, it seems, right now as we have these different curfews and quarantine measures that are going into effect to uh, mitigate the spread of coronavirus. So a couple of things for New York when you talk about that. That's their education system. Just to give an idea, uh, they're working with Apple right now, and I'm, I'm using New York as an example of what we'll probably maybe see uh, take place in other metro areas, other places as these effects go in. Uh, they're working to give out up to 300,000 iPads right now um, to, to get these out to students because when you think about online education, you know, for, for some of us, maybe that's a thing where it's like, okay, yeah, that's, that shouldn't be that hard to implement. A lot of colleges do this already. A lot of schools do this. But um, you do have a, kind of a, a tech disparity there on who has access to this, even broadband access. And T-Mobile is one of the companies right now uh, working with New York City officials to try to try to help everybody get internet access who needs it. And hopefully, you know, this is a sign of, of things when it comes to the tech side of things. And again, we're digital trends, and so I'll give it to you from that angle. Um, granted, this affects so much more than that, but uh, clearly broadband access is going to be very important. And there's a lot of companies that are working to do that. Comcast has put in some measures. T-Mobile, I believe Verizon is as well. Uh, but that's one thing that they're doing to try to help people get access. So that's kind of something that maybe we'll see more as we go across the country, more of these closures, more tech firms trying to make sure that everybody has access to broadband internet. Very important, especially when it comes to the school side of things. A couple other things from tech companies. Uh, naturally, a lot of you, in case you didn't know, probably are finding out about Zoom right now. So Zoom is a program that, that we use here, actually. I've, I've been familiar with it for a while, but it's something where you can organize online meetings. You know, it's, a, it's another meeting software. Uh, but they are clearly having a very big uh, boom in downloads right now, and that's because people are needing to do this, whether it's for work, whether it's for school, all kinds of different things where we now need to interact online. And Zoom, uh, with their downloads, they said on Thursday it was the biggest day ever that they'd ever had. They're also offering it up free to uh, schools, to some different schools, so they've got some uh, different accounts that they're setting up to where people can have free video conferencing. That's a pretty big move right there uh, to make sure that you know kids and, and students and teachers can have access to some kind of software to interact as we're all, again, finding out how to do, how to go about all this, you know? Um, 
so that's something else that's, that's pretty big. So you can look at Zoom on there. You also have things with Skype and other companies trying to develop uh, that over over the internet uh, interaction that we that we need. A um, few other things. So again, walking through updating you on some of the tech angles that are associated with coronavirus, and certainly there are a lot of those. Uh, Apple is making some efforts to get rid of some of the misleading or blatantly false apps that are in their app store associated with coronavirus. So. As at any time happens, when, when there's some kind of a big issue, you're gonna have people that will try to take advantage of it. And this is something where we should all be aware of what we're downloading. And I'll talk about misinformation here in just a minute. That's certainly a big issue that we're gonna cover on today's show. Uh, but this is Apple working with this to where they're removing anything from the App Store that has coronavirus associated with it. Uh, they're bidding the release of any entertainment or gaming apps that have that name in it, um, that are related to it. They're trying to make sure that anything that is in there is associated with a government organization a health-focused NGO or companies deeply credentialed in health issues to make sure that you aren't downloading apps or accidentally or people out there who are now trying to find out information who maybe aren't researching what they're downloading, not downloading these, these um, you know, misinformation apps that are out there. And there certainly are some that are trying to naturally take advantage of hacking, trying to steal information because that's just what people will do. So you have to be very careful on that. And association with the hacking side of things, there was a hack, this was announced uh, just earlier this morning, um, that it, it looks like there was a, an attempt to hack the U.S. Health and Human Services Department. They suffered a cyber attack on their system late Sunday uh, from the information that we're getting right now where somebody tried to get in to slow their research and efforts to combat COVID-19. So that's how what we're dealing with, with with some of these things. So it does look like they were able to control it. It doesn't look like a lot of things happened with it. So thankfully, their security was robust enough. But again, bringing you up to date on what's going on. There are some people out there that are going to try to take advantage of things. So be very careful of, of what you're downloading and where you're going. There are some... Uh, tracking maps that are being put out right now. So there has been one out from the Johns Hopkins University, which is a live tracker of what's happening with coronavirus and the different outbreaks. And if you go there, you can kind of take a look at it as it's tracking it from where it spread uh, to where it's at right now, active cases, people who have recovered from it. They've got all the data that they can possibly gather uh, from a, a myriad of different sources to try to make sure that you're up to date on what's happening with it. And it is kind of a, a fascinating look. Um, also, it can be very valuable if you're trying to understand where things are spreading. So that's one from Johns Hopkins. You also have one that's out now from Microsoft for the Bing uh, Bing browser. If you're using Bing, you can pull up one, and it's kind of some of the same information that's out there. Again, though, hackers are utilizing that. You may see some emails that come through that are going to try to get you to click on something or try to get you to download something in association with these maps. Be very, very careful of that. Uh, that's another hacking and phishing campaign that's going on. So again, you know, the best places to go to are, are you know, reputable news organizations, sites where they verify information. We verify all of our information here, but certainly the CDC, the World Health Organization, those are the places to go for the accurate information uh, that I would recommend uh, on my end. But going from that, again, keeping you up to date on everything that's happening, there is also uh, some more updates on news associated with Google and whether they're creating a triage website to help get people to testing places. Now, there was an announcement uh, by President Trump that said one thing, and it turns out this wasn't exactly exactly accurate. I'm going to give you what, what Google has actually said right now. So this is their research sister company called Verily. So this is owned by Google or Alphabet, if you will, which is the overall company. And they are working on a website that would actually walk you through certain uh, tests, kind of a, a quiz, if you will, where you can take a look and, and you go through it and answer these questions. And then they will give you an idea of if you should go in to get tested. And if so, where you can go to get tested. But here's the key thing. This isn't a nationwide rollout. This is only in a testing phase right now. And I believe it's two different counties in Northern California, Santa Clara County and San Mateo County is where they're testing this out to where you could enter in that information, they can give you an idea of where you can go. And they would, of course, like to roll this out nationwide. But right now, it's a ways away from that, according to what they're saying. Uh, they've got to test all this out at first and then, and then figure out the testing places. I mean, there's a lot of tech behind that. But that is a start. Uh, so if you are in either of those counties, you can do it. You just have to be 18 years or older and have a Google account in order to sign up for it and take a look. But that's what I've got right now. And again, this information changes rapidly. And we'll keep you up to date at digitaltrends.com or on our Twitter account or wherever you follow us. You can go along and make sure that you're up to date with the information as quick as we can get it out to you. And like I said, just follow those verified sources. That's one of the most important things. All right, continuing on, 
Uh, let's talk about a couple of other things. So we do have uh, some other news that's going on, and let's talk about Microsoft. So uh, with all of these different conventions being shut down, companies are still trying to figure out ways to get out the information about their new products. And Microsoft, Microsoft, with their Xbox Series X, certainly a huge, huge console that's going to be coming out here later this year, uh, they're figuring out ways to get out their information. And they're going to be having actually a live stream coming up here in just a little bit, or just a little bit, a little bit later this week. Uh, they're going to be having one where they're going to be giving out some more information. But they released some videos showcasing some of the functionality. And this is actually pretty cool, taking a look at what they're doing. So right there, you're seeing just how quickly you can resume a different game. Now, we've all done this. If you play on a console, whether it's a PlayStation or an Xbox, you know that delay of when you want to switch to a different game can be frustrating because it just takes forever to load. It's a lot of information, so I understand why it takes time. But this is showcasing how quickly you could go from a game to a game. That's jumping right back into the game, not having to go through the intro, not having to go through any of that, right back to the gameplay of where you were. And part of that is because of the fact that they have this SSD support. So some of the specs that they released, they said that they've got uh, 16 gigs of RAM that'll come with it with a one terabyte custom SSD storage drive. And I believe you can even add on to that as well as part of what they were announcing. Uh, so that's a, that's a big improvement. That's a lot of massive amount of memory, which is what can help function something like that, where you can switch between games so quickly. Also, another thing that they're, they're showcasing is the ray tracing capabilities. And ray tracing just gives you those sharper graphics. It gives you like, if there's fog out there, you can see the fog, you can see the shadows. Um, it's really, really amazing once you see this technology in effect. And that's something with this new hardware that they're saying they're going to be able to do. So ray tracing games is, uh, is something that's, that's going to be huge when it comes to the Series X. Again, something they're showing off. They also said they'll support 8K gaming and frame rates up to 120 frames per second. Uh, that's pretty massive. When we get 8K games, you know, I, I don't know. That kind of depends on what the releases are, but it's going to be something that would be future-proofed to support it. So pretty cool stuff to find out about that, again, with the Xbox Series X. And we'll, we'll be finding out more information about that as we go forward as they release it online during these virtual conferences. What's missing, though, is PlayStation. PlayStation hasn't really announced a whole lot on their end, and we're hoping that maybe this will spur a little bit more information from them because their console is supposed to come out this, this winter as well. Both of them scheduled for winter releases. Again, everything's kind of up in the air at this point, depending on what delays are, are out there for supply chains, but it appears that Microsoft is going forward. Uh, PlayStation, I want to hear what you're, what you're going to have. Let us know. Uh, all right, continuing on here as we go through. Uh, we are, let's see, uh, taking a look at some other trending news. So talking about gaming, that's definitely big, and I bet a lot of you at home right now are streaming because more than 20 million people played on stream concurrently yesterday, and that was setting, uh, setting a record. So previously it was 19 million, uh, now 20 million people streaming concurrently, and I expect a lot of people are going to be getting into this. And uh, streaming, it was 20,313,000, according to data from the PC Gaming Platform's website. Uh, that's, a, that's a lot of people streaming at the same time. And as we're all, you know, adjusting to these kind of new norms that are going to be going on, uh, which are not norms at all, a lot of people are going to be streaming gaming. Xbox actually went down. Xbox Live went down for a while. Um, but hopefully all these organizations are going to be beefing that up as we all get on to game some more. So there is that. And I know that we need to get to a break here pretty quickly because we've got some other things we're going to be talking about. We've got a full uh, hour and a half of, of programming here today that we're going to be talking about all kinds of things in tech. So I want to make sure that you're aware of that. But a couple other things. Now, this is association with coronavirus, naturally. But there are some updates from places like Uber Eats, which announced there will be zero delivery dollar delivery fees for uh, locally ordered food. So that's going out uh, nationwide, at least for the U.S., um, also Canada. So delivery fees will be waived. And that's, uh, that's a good thing to actually help out a lot of these restaurants that are going to have to be either going to delivery only or closing. Um, that is a tough industry. So that's a great way to support them that they're working on right there. And there's some other things associated with that. We've got all the updates at digitaltrends.com. They also said they're going to deliver 300,000 free meals to health workers. Certainly that's important as well that they can get that kind of delivery also. And we'll see what other companies do, uh, what other companies do, you know, in, in reaction to this, how they respond. It's, uh, it's a new world, so everything's changing really quickly. We'll try to keep you up to date. And speaking of that, I do have this. Hey, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. It's now time for the, the product, product of, of the, the day. day. 
the product of the day will continue on here. So this is what I have right now. And this is pretty important actually for everybody who's gonna be working from home, you need some good headphones. And this is what we have. This is the one more triple driver in-ear headphones. They are high res, they've got this bass driven sound. And one thing I wanted to showcase too is just opening this box. So this is what the box comes in. And normally I would have taken these out already, but I just kind of wanted to showcase how nice the packaging is. I know that's kind of a minor detail sometimes, but that really does look nice when you get it. So here you can see you've got your case, you've got uh, several, a bunch of different um, options there for your earpieces. So you can find one that'll fit for you, six different sets of silicone ear tips, three sets of foam ear tips. Uh, the headphones themselves have really great sound. Um, it comes with a magnetic clasping traveling case and, uh, and a matching shirt clip as well. And it even has the adapter for airplanes if you do plan to be taking an airplane ride anytime soon. But these are, these are definitely some great headphones. And uh, the deal right now is they are $70.81 if you click that link below. It's down from 80 bucks, so they're on sale a bit, but that is right there. So whatever platform you're watching on, see that bit.ly link? Click that, you can go there, order these, and uh, have some good headphones while you're gaming or doing your work from home. That is our deal of the day. All right, continuing on here with Digital Trends Live. Again, we are live and uh, I appreciate everybody who's joining us. So coming up next, we have Jeremy Kaplan. who's gonna introduce a package that he had where he actually went out and tried out a new way of working out where he could cut the time in half. He's gonna be talking about that. We've got Sarah Evans who's gonna be joining us. We've got Drew Prindle for Awesome Tech You Can't Buy Yet. All kinds of things coming up. So stick around, we'll be right back with more Digital Trends Live. Welcome back to Digital Trends Live. I'm Greg Nibbler and thank you very much for joining us. Wherever you are, hit that subscribe button, share the show, let other people know about it, bring you up to date on what is going on in tech. And our own Jeremy Kaplan, our editor in chief, is standing by where he's gonna be talking about something that he did where he was able to cut his workout time in half, which I think we could all appreciate that right now. Jeremy, hello, how you doing? I'm doing pretty good, how are you, Greg? Uh, doing good, and I know uh, we're broadcasting from different locations here as we go through. We all know what's going on, and Jeremy is there on location right now. Uh, but I know we're gonna be playing this video. I want you to tell me about what this is that you went and did. Yeah, so uh, basically we're looking into biohacking, which doesn't necessarily mean uh, altering your DNA so that you can resist disease or breathe underwater or something crazy like that. In this case, it means advanced science and a better understanding of biology that enables you to get a better workout. The idea being, can you get the all the efficacy of a 45 minute workout in a mere 20 minutes? Sounds almost too good to believe, so we had to go down and try it out. And that's what we're gonna take a look at right now. So you went and did this workout, you gave it a shot, you, uh, you, you were able to cut this in half, and I understand that, are we gonna get to see you work out in this? Yeah, you're oh, <laughs> sweating all, yeah. Although to be honest, one of the things that was neat about this is, because you're working out so little, uh, and because a lot of the emphasis is placed on the recovery phase of the workout process, there actually isn't all that much sweat involved. It's just the next day you're like, oh my gosh, I really <laughs> felt like I got a workout there. That's awesome. Well, I'm excited to see it. So let's go ahead and roll this right now. This is Jeremy Kaplan out with Hacked testing out this new system. 
It's 10.30, it's Friday, and we're on our way to the gym. But it's not just any gym. We're going to Hacked. This is a new advanced kind of gym that uses advancements in biotechnology and biofeedback to give you a 20 minute workout that has all of the efficacy of a 40 minute workout. Which is great because I had cheeseburgers for breakfast and I could use a workout. Let's get going. Hey, we're inside at Hack Fitness with the founder, Pam Gold. Thank you so much for having us over here. Oh, thanks so much for coming, guys. It's a pleasure. Tell us about your business. What are we looking at here? So this is the future of fitness. The future of fitness. It is. We combine um, a very efficient, uh, quantified, effective minimum dose workout with the best of the recovery modalities and a lot of assessments to keep optimizing the program. What does that mean for me, the guy that wants to come in and work out on a machine? Absolutely, so it means you get to spend a lot less time and get a lot better results and you're honoring the holistic nature of your body. So you're gonna work out hard and then you're gonna prioritize recovery which is the part after the workout when your body's actually making the adaptations that you just kind of made like, hey, all this stress, all this strain, the body actually gets broken down when we work out, but then it's that process of recovery when we get stronger. And then by having optimization um, data points, we can keep getting it more and more precise. We don't want to overtrain. We don't want to over recover. We want the right balance. So you've got a variety of machines around here, which looks sort of like ordinary machines, but also slightly different, a little more futuristic perhaps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so basically on the strength training side, we have something called the ARX, which is computerized adaptive resistance uh, training. So you've got a computer screen that shows you each moment of the workout, how much work you're doing. So it holds you accountable, keeps you motivated, and shows how much stronger you're getting over time. Then on the uh, cardiovascular side, we have bikes called the Carol, which uses artificial intelligence to give you the equivalent of a 45 minute jog in under nine minutes. Wow. And again, it uses artificial intelligence. It's able to fine tune the resistance that's perfect for you to max you out in just two 20 second sprints. Makes so sense. you're literally getting chased by a tiger just for 40 seconds. And that's been shown to be more effective at improving your metabolic markers. So Pam, tell me what inspired you to create this gym? Well, believe it or not, um, I used to be a personal trainer who worked out four to six hours a day. And then I went back to work running a company and suddenly I found myself if I was lucky having 20 minutes a day to work out. So I started doing research around what um, better ways there were to work out, more efficient um, you know, protocols and what equipment there was out there. I'm looking forward to it. Let's jump in and try some of this stuff. Let's do it. All right, so phase one of let's call it the workout of the future. Mm -hmm. What exactly am I standing on here? The fit, okay. fit 3D, what's the Fit 3D? So this is gonna give you a 360 degree picture of your body with all your measurements and body composition. So this is gonna be brass tacks where you're starting out. And so then as we go through the program, you'll be able to see the results. Okay, so you had your body scan. This is our cardiovascular piece of equipment. CAROL stands for Cardiovascular Optimized Logic. Okay. So this uses AI to give you the perfect resistance to max you out in two 20 second sprints. But things to note, there's only going to be resistance when you're being chased by the tiger. <laughs> so two times you'll be chased by the tiger. The rest of the time, it's like walking in the park. Okay. okay? There aren't any tigers in my park. <laughs> yeah, no. New York City, baby. All right, so you're gonna put on headphones. And today we're gonna to do the intense, which is the two 20 second sprints. Okay. I will hit start. You hear her? Yep. Go for it. Now, out of the corner of your eye, you catch sight of a shadow in the distance and it's racing towards you at full speed. The shadow of a saber toothed tiger. You need to sprint away now. Sprint fast. Your life depends on it. The tiger's gaining on you. Sprint harder, faster. The tiger's chasing after me. I'm trying to get away from him. <sighs> okay, you survived the tiger. How was it? I survived. It was definitely intense. Uh -huh. A couple of short bursts of intensity and then a lot of deep breathing. Yeah, yeah. Reminded me of the Apple Watch. There's a whole breathing exercise that you go through there. Yes. Is that the in important part here? Is it the intensity well, of the workout, the durations? So definitely the intensity of the workout is the really most important part of this machine. Breath work is important all the time. 
So I love that this machine incorporates the breath work into the routine. But the tiger part, that's a little scary. Yeah, the tiger part is, is, is for real, it's 20 seconds. And the point of that is to get you in a glycogen depletion. We're just getting started, right? What's just next? getting started. Next, we're gonna go on to the strength training. Let's do it. Okay, so next you're gonna experience the ARX, which is the adaptive resistance exercise. So have a seat. So I'm gonna start, you're gonna have a five second countdown, and this is gonna move at you. And you can resist again that three out of 10. Like you're playing with nieces and nephews, you're trying to slow it down. Breathing and pressing, breathing and pressing, breathing and pressing. Keep pressing right here as it changes directions, keep pressing. Perfect. And now give a little bit more of a press, a little bit more of a press. Yes, perfect. Pause. Now this time I want you to go five out of 10. Oh, what a weird sensation. Mm-hmm, press, 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 press. Keep pressing and breathing, pressing and breathing. Press, great job, keep breathing, pressing, perfect, pause. So right from the first rep, I want you to be looking at this one, and I want this line to be up here. And I want you to be really serious, because what I want us to see is that the red ends up being significantly higher than the black. Okay. Without compromising breath and the integrity of our joint position. All right, okay? so lots of, lots of handle, I'm you gonna try. It? So now it's serious, it's game on. You are serious? This is like you're being chased by a tiger. You're gonna breathe evenly, breathe evenly, keep breathing. Now don't let it come down, don't let it come down, keep it up, keep it up. Big press, breathing and pressing. Shoulders down, core engaged. Big press, keep breathing and pressing. Nice and steady, nice and steady. Perfect, rest. Fatigue is our friend. We've been, we've been conditioned to think that fatigue is bad. Actually on this, fatigue is good. Just no compromising. Perfect, and you are done. <gasps> Look at these numbers, 175% up. That was exhausting. I know. Okay, great. And so we can now look at your data. You can see how much you crushed it. You did 175% more work in this second set. Now going forward, we're going to have all of this data to keep you motivated, hold you accountable, and show you the results that you're getting. So that's one of the reasons why this set of equipment is so effective and so um, efficient is that we're able to get those really high eccentric lowering weights. It's really fascinating. Okay, so Jeremy, we're now on the recovery part of the your journey. The best part, right? Yeah, you get, you get to recover. And recovery is really, really integral. This isn't being lazy. This is giving your body what it needs to get the adaptation response that you just earned with that workout. So this is great. What you're doing here is you're breathing in something called the Nano V. The Nano V uses water vapor and a specific frequency of light to fake your body out. So your body starts making the good free radicals and combating the oxidative stress that we all have in our cells. Got it. So it helps your cells function better and it'll help you feel better. And five minutes, 10 minutes of this and you're recovered? So this one, there's a 30 minute option or a 15 minute option. And you can stack this with some of the other recovery modalities and you're gonna feel awesome. Just feels like there's a cold breeze on me, but it's the cold breeze of science. Thanks to Pam Gold and Hack Fitness, I had a great workout here. Now the hard part. Relaxing. Big press, big press. Nice. One more? Nope. <laughs> I, I love the ending of that, number one. Uh, also, very impressive for everybody out there who wanted to see Jeremy Kaplan in shorts. You just got to see that. But more importantly, the tech behind that was, was really, really cool to see that reduced. But one thing you guys didn't cover was the pricing. How much does this cost? Well, yes, science is not cheap. That's a very clear fact. First of all, just consider how different that experience was from the experience of ordinarily being in the gym. I mean, I was just doing a bench press. Think about ordinarily, you just have some weights on a bar. You move them, you move them back. You've got no idea what's going on. This is the quantified self, right? This is the promise of technology merging with fitness. And gosh, is it expensive. So uh, <laughs> they break this down into strength training, into cardio, and into recovery. And each one has separate costs. The minimum you're going to pay is about $450. And that's a very limited amount of access to the gym. Is it worth it? That's the real big question here. And as somebody that is a junkie for data, you saw me looking at that screen. I was just saying, here's exactly how much exertion I'm putting in at every exact minute. That felt really neat. I just felt like Rocky when he was training against that <laughs> Russian guy. Remember, they put all the electrodes on that guy's body to right. see exactly what he was doing. That's what it felt like. I think it's cool. A lot of money, though, so you really have to weigh that cost. Yeah. I mean, one of those things, you know, when you see tech like this come out, a lot of times, at first, it's really expensive. Maybe eventually this becomes more of the norm where you get somebody else kind of adopting it. But it definitely really, really cool to see. Yeah, absolutely. Especially the, I mean, artificial intelligence 
fueling that bike. It's just nothing like what you're used to. Well, it's pretty amazing. And Jeremy, thank you for going through the workout too to demonstrate this thing. Uh, yep. hurts to be. <laughs> you survived. We appreciate it. Jeremy Kaplan, thank you so much. Always a pleasure. Thank you. All right. That is Jeremy Kaplan, our editor-in-chief. You can read all about that too at Digital Trends and, and go back through and take a look at that video. Really, really impressive stuff. Actually, now I wish that was here so that I could try it out. But we have to continue on with the show. We've got more coverage coming up. So talking about coronavirus, which of course is inevitable. It's unavoidable. And how is it going to affect small businesses? That's something we're going to cover next with Sarah Evans. She's going to talk about some different ways that you can actually help out some small businesses, some ways that tech can help enable some things as well as we go through this rapidly changing event that we're all experiencing. So that's coming up next. Stick around back here in a minute with more Digital Trends Live. Welcome back to you, Digital Trends Live. I'm Greg Nibbler, and thank you very much for joining us wherever you are. We appreciate it. We try to keep you up to date on what is happening in technology, and certainly keeping up to date with the news right now is a challenge, but we are going to do that uh, as we talk through this next interview, because as we see a lot of places shutting down, certainly the coronavirus uh, issue is affecting a lot of small businesses. So what does that mean for them? What can we do about that? What are the effects long term? We're going to talk about all that more. We have Sarah Evans, who's joining us right now. Once again, Sarah, thank you so much for joining us here. Thank you so much. And, and like many, I've closed down my office. I'm home. School is closed. So we have little voices in the background. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> they will be noted for that. Um, so, so talking about this, you know, as you're working from home, as we see all these businesses uh, closing down and sending people home, I mean, we hear at Digital Trends, the majority of staff is at home uh, right now. And, and, and seeing how this has an effect on things, I guess, to walk through from your standpoint, being a business owner, what kind of effect is this going to have in the short term for small businesses? 
You know, the National Federation of Independent Business released a study or a survey three days ago of 300,000 SMBs who said only 23% of them were impacted negatively right now. I firmly believe that it's going to increase exponentially over the coming days when we see more social distancing and more closures. Um, so it's something we really have to be prepared for and, and think ahead. Yeah, and, and thinking about it, you know, just as we're even talking right here, there's more rollouts of closures that are happening. I mean, New York and I believe New Jersey and Connecticut are recommending all bars and restaurants close down, um, and that's probably something that's going to be happening in a lot of other places. So what are some steps that I guess from, from either side, I mean, you direct us here, you, you know about this stuff, some steps maybe that small businesses can do and maybe some steps that uh, consumers can do to help out some of these businesses? One of the most important things right now is something I'm calling hashtag pay ahead, hashtag gift ahead. These are simple things that SMBs can add to their websites, to their text and email campaigns. We are asking people to simply spend the money they would have in the coming weeks or month or months and have a pre-purchase plan. So if I'm going to go to the hair salon or the dry cleaner um, or anybody that I would have frequented that relies on me as a patron to have their doors open, Let's buy ahead. Uh, that way, if we can't go right now, but we have some purchases on hold for the coming weeks, that can help them um, stay afloat in the meantime. Also, the gift ahead component is really just buying gift cards. They're gift cards you can use for yourself. You can give to friends and family members. Anything you can do to help frequent um, those places that you would have anyway. So it's not asking for a donation or to give something more than you would have. It's just money you would have been spending anyway. So SMBs can put these messages on websites, email texts, social media. In fact, I say create a special link for social right now with key messaging for pay ahead, gift ahead, and leave it up there for the foreseeable future. And consumers can help by just doing this and posting about the fact that they're doing it. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. So that's a recommendation for all those business owners out there that are watching and people who are clearly working from home like you are right now. You know, so get those links out there for people to, I guess, to give them the opportunity to even buy ahead and pay ahead. So that's great. Is there any particular service you would recommend that businesses use? Well, you can look at the most frequent places that a lot of SMBs use, uh, Venmo, Square, PayPal. Um, in fact, if they're not using those, getting something set up now in, in the interim to just help with people who want to buy ahead. Um, if you don't have gift cards enabled, uh, pay ahead still works if you're using one of those, um, one of those servers. Um, looking at this too, you know, as we see things rapidly change and, you know, and a lot is, a lot is changing really quickly, but we are seeing some different apps and services adapt to this. I know that Uber Eats announced that they're going to have $0 delivery fees for at least some restaurants. Can you speak to that and maybe what we can see as a trend when it comes to delivery apps? Absolutely. And I am telling people now look for the helpers, not the hoarders, people who are really trying to do good and help people who could be severely impacted. I know Grubhub is temporarily suspending commission from restaurants. Um, there's a, a platform called OneDine who's offering free tap and pay sensors to all restaurants. That way, when social distancing comes back, people are going to be hesitant about touching touch screens. So ways that we can make the process more cleanly for folks. Forbes 8 is launching a free digital summit on Friday for all businesses, especially SMBs, to help them prepare and cope during these times. And I'm also looking at large companies like Apple, Lululemon, Patagonia, Warby Parker, who are closed but still paying workers. So using these as best practices, look to see who's doing it well instead of generic coronavirus is here messaging that we're actually doing something to help and support. I love that. Look for the helpers, not the hoarders. That is a, that is a great mantra right there. Um, so seeing this, you know, as, as again, things rapidly change, where do you see this going, you know, as we come out? Do you think that the business landscape for small businesses is going to be, I, I know that may be hard to predict, but changed in general? Do you see some of these practices that we're instituting being something that's going to be more permanent? I really do for the foreseeable future think things are going to change. We're going to realize how much we can actually do at home. I think as a, a busy mom and business owner, I'm seeing what I can actually accomplish at home. So getting people back out may be a, a bit of a struggle at first. And we're going to um, hopefully see businesses, uh, SMBs, especially those in the entertainment or hospitality realm, doing some unique things to reach people, whether it's dinner on the lawn, so we're not indoors um, in, their, in their restaurants, or looking for other ways to engage with customers, even if it's through delivery. Um, but we're, we're definitely going to see the landscape, landscape change. It already has, and now we just have to figure out innovative ways to stay connected. Social distancing doesn't have to mean we have to not be social. 
Right, and that's that's a great uh, great piece of advice right there because it's going to be interesting, you know, like we said, to see how this all changes and how it all shakes out, and obviously rapidly. Um, you know, by the minute things are changing as, as we're talking right now, things are changing with this. Um, looking forward for you too, I want to let people know where they can go to follow you and follow along with your companies. I mean, you are a business owner right here talking to us. So what can people do to support you? Uh, you, I work in the PR, uh, realm. So working with companies who really need help around what to do during this time, uh, messaging, ideation and support with both internal and external comms, my website, sevenspr.com is the best place to reach us. Well, Sarah, thank you so much for joining us. Really interesting getting your perspective on that. I love that. I want to make sure I say it again. Uh, hashtag bad, hashtag gift ahead. So some things that we can all do and certainly something that businesses should take a look at utilizing social media and, and these different paid platforms. Sarah, thanks so much for being here on Digital Trends Live. Thank you. All right, so really interesting. And again, you know, as things rapidly advance, we're talking about what people can do now uh, as we go through this and figuring out how you can take care of your business, but also support some other businesses as well. So definitely an interesting interview there. Coming up next, we've got Drew Prindle, because awesome tech you can't buy yet does continue on despite everything else. And this is where Drew scours the internet to find the best and sometimes the strangest crowdfunding campaigns. And we present those to you. That's coming up next. Stick around back here in a minute with more Digital Trends Live.
Welcome back to Digital Trends Live. I'm Greg Nibbler, and thank you very much for joining us. Wherever you are, hit that subscribe button, share the show, and part of a series here that we have of Digital Trends is about women in technology. It's called Women with Bites, celebrating uh, the different roles of women in technology and the successes of that, and that's what we're going to be talking about right now, and a lot more, in particular, a study that just came out. To join us, once again, we have Michelle Romano here on the show. Michelle, thank you so much for joining us. Really excited to have you here, and just to give everybody some context, can we talk about this survey that you had put out? Yeah, so ClearBank has been investing in a ton of uh, businesses. Last year, we invested nearly a billion dollars into 2,200 different companies. So looked at our own portfolio of companies, especially with female founders, and found some really interesting kind of insights from that. So um, talking about that, you know, and the survey, and like you said, that's a tremendous amount of money, you know, that ClearBank's yeah. been investing. So clearly seeing some successes there. Uh, how did you conduct this, actually? How did you pull in all this information? Yeah, we did it internally. We looked um, through every single female founder we had. And, you know, it was really, really interesting because we found that female-led companies, um, I can think the bad news first and then the good news. So right now, the female-founded companies produced about half of the revenue as their male-led counterparts. And so they're certainly not as big. But on the bright side, they are growing far faster than their male counterparts, which we think um, is really exciting. And then the other thing that we found is that they are about 50% more capital efficient. So they're spending about half of the amount in cost to produce the same amount in revenue. And I think that's probably, you know, the most relevant insight today, because as we go into, you know, kind of this moment where, you know, the economy is fairly uncertain, um, the fact that their burn is basically half of their male counterparts, I think, really well positions them for the future here. Yeah, that's going to be incredibly important. Like you said, as we're going through this moment, you know, whatever comes out of this, uh, certainly that's going to be a huge part of it. Uh, why do you think that is? Is it, Was there any science behind that, or this is just the science that we saw? This is the science that we saw so far. I mean, we still have to do a lot of work to see um, what is that specifically. I think it comes from there has generally been less funding available. I mean, we've backed eight times more women than the venture capital industry average. But I mean, again, the venture capital industry average is still about 2%. And so it's very, very small. And so when you have less capital, you make more, more do with less capital. And certainly that was something um, that I experienced. I mean, I was a founder for 10 years, a bootstrap founder for 10 years before um, you know, raising any capital. And so I think uh, it's, it's deeply ingrained. I also think women are incredibly resourceful <laughs> at, you know, finding resources where there seems to be none and, and constantly thinking about the most capital efficient way um, to do something. Well, and, and t speaking, you know, from your experience, obviously incredibly successful and being a business owner for so long, uh, what are some of, I always feel like education is one of the important things to make sure that people are aware of issues. Uh, what are some of the biggest issues that you think are facing uh, women in, in technology, in businesses, uh, when it comes to, to finding success? I mean, you mentioned the lack of capital, which is extremely yeah. frustrating. What are some of the other obstacles? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I'll go back to that again, right? If, if we can have great ideas, and then if we cannot figure out how to get those ideas funded, they will always be limited in, in size and scope. And that doesn't mean that every venture is perfect for venture capital. It just means that that, that is so much of the gap that is between um, you know early or, or staying small for a long time and really getting it um, to that next point. And so that's why we've spent so much time um, figuring out how to do this. And one of the things that I think is very, very interesting about what we've done is we didn't change things at the top of the funnel. It was not like we were, you know, sourcing for female founders or, you know, specifically looking for them. It was actually because the only way we could invest in 2,200 different companies last year is to use AI to do so. Um, and so that means that we, we were effectively digitizing the underwriting that VCs had been doing for a long time. We were looking at CAC to LTV ratios. You know, were you spending less on your advertising? And just by doing that alone, we took the bias out of the investment making decision process and funded way more women. And so I think it really points to the fact that, you know, we're seeing bias in the system that's not really based on actually the numbers that female founders are putting forward. They're, they're because, you know, it's still a human to human industry. Um, in the venture world. I think beyond that, um, there's all of the typical things around networks, around having the mentors, um, and everything else that has to do 
uh, with finding balance in your life and, and juggling all of those as a female founder. Well, I love the fact that the AI took out you know, that bias and just looks at numbers and looks at algorithms and says yeah. this is what's going to be most successful. That's, that's a great use case. Um, could you see other use cases for that going forward, utilizing artificial intelligence for these kinds of decision-making uh, things? Oh, a hundred percent. I think that, um, you know, there's a few people that always want to talk about AI and the, the doomsday scenarios and that we're going to take the biases we have today and build those into the AI. I mean, we're seeing the exact opposite. And so I think, you know, we could use this in how we make investment decisions. We could use this um, in how we scale these companies. Like we can give tons of insights um, that would have been only available to kind of a select few or within a select small network of people. And we can start giving that back to founders and really, really enabling them um, to make the best decisions. Well, and, and talking about ClearBank too. So investing in 2,200 businesses, in a year and going through all that process and, and figuring that out and utilizing the AI. How do you see your business you know, going forward here in the next few years as we see more technology be enabled? How are you going to be changing up some of your decision making when it comes to that? Yeah, so the nice part about, about, I mean, when we started, like this was a very tough business to build. We had huge default rates, we were you know, learning, but now as our algorithms and, and AI has gotten better and better and better, we think that we can continue to expand this into different verticals, into different countries. Like one of the things that we know for sure is that it is hard to raise capital in America today. Um, you know, even if you are the best founder, this is a three to six month process. Um, you know, investors are very, very acute to what's happening in the markets. And so, you know, turns like this can make it impossible, um, if not incredibly difficult for founders to raise money. And so um, I think that that's where we're going to expand is looking at, you know, verticals beyond e-commerce and looking at countries um, beyond the U.S. Uh, looking at the report itself, too, because I want to make sure that everybody's aware of it, that they can go see it. It's at uh, yeah. crunchbase.com um, is where, where I'm seeing the link there for it. Um, you know, and we've talked about some of these, some of the findings from it. But what were some other findings that you, you were surprised by when it came to this? Yeah, I think the other thing is just the diversity um, of businesses that, that we, when we looked at kind of qualitatively at this data, I mean, a lot of it was, let's talk about, you know, an underserved population that doesn't look big enough to serve, right? Like, uh, we have one company that's done incredibly well in hair care products for African American women, and was constantly told that, you know, they would never be able to have shelf space at a, at a national chain pharmacy because their market segment wasn't big enough. Well, she's created just this killer business online and doing that and has completely proven um, that wrong. And so I think that's been one area we've seen businesses that are niche that have now totally expanded. Um, we have seen um, another another category that I would have never expected um, was you know sexual uh, wellness and health. We have um, a bunch of companies in our portfolio that have kind of reinvented um, all sorts of things around women that, you know, no one was was giving the time of day for. There was a lot of them that can advertise on conventional platforms and they've all done incredibly well. And so I think it's just um, the other thing that we just saw is the creativity, the depth and the breadth of all of these businesses that female founders uh, had started. Well, I love that too, looking at just from the business standpoint, all these markets that have been underserved, you know, people, there's so many business opportunities there that I would yeah. think that, you know, this kind of information really would help people make their investing decisions. Totally. I mean, look, it's, it's classic, but again, think about, um, you know, we're, we're a competitor to venture capital in many ways. And so the, one of the, one of the issues with BC is that it has always been prone to human biases, right? Like if you haven't experienced a problem yourself, um, it's hard to imagine that is a problem, which is why it's easier to get funding for, you know, an expensive bicycle with an iPad strapped and it called a Peloton, which is much more of the demographic of probably a typical venture capitalist than a couponing app, which is trying to save Americans an average of $20 on their grocery shopping bill. And so I think that's been the same thing with some of these niche industries or what people thought were niche industries around women. I mean, you look at even the category of, you know, um, leak proof underwear, which it was, you know, thanks and next and a bunch of these companies that came out. I mean, you can ask the founders to tell you their stories of pitching VCs and they would be like, I, I don't know what a leak is. Like the, there was all of these questions. And so um, what they thought was a niche category has become a hugely mainstream part um, of that industry, 
you know, in, in kind of even the last three years. Uh, but given that it wasn't someone, something that was experienced, um, you know, there was a lot of overlooking that. Would you have any recommendation for somebody out there who's, who's started a business, thinks they have a product that's, you know, not getting, uh, or that could tackle a market that's not being served, but they're having trouble getting funding, having trouble getting exposure to it. What kind of re recommendation would you have to that person? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, come to Clear Bank. That would be one of them. Is that we? This is one of the reasons we started the company. Is we wanted to give at least founders an option. I mean, we called their product the twenty-minute term sheet for a reason. At least you could get a term sheet in twenty minutes that would give you an alternative explanation. Um, you can do genuinely a lot with like bootstrapping and getting early market data. I still never think it's a great idea as an investor to give up a huge portion of your company at the seed or the early stage. There's so many easy ways to test. And I always paint the picture to remind entrepreneurs what the old world looked like. I mean, you know, you used to have to invent a product, create a prototype, and then order fifty dollars to $100,000 of inventory before you could see if anyone ever wanted it. You know, now with digital advertising and crowdfunding, I mean, you can make a single product and actually see if people would like it. And this is very different than market research where people would say they'd like your product, but they didn't actually have to buy it. I mean, on Kickstarter, you have to put your credit card in right. knowing that, it, it, that the product may not even ship. And so I think then when you have traction, it's, it's a lot easier because you're not arguing, is this a good idea or not? You're arguing, how fast can I grow? Um, and so I think, you know, that was one of the reasons we certainly want to be an option for founders. Um, but I think there it, it's today it is cheaper and easier to start a business than ever before. And so my advice to the founders is, is take the plunge and let's do it. Love it. Again, you're so right about that idea that you can get a prototype or something made without having to order 100,000 of them and totally. just be stuck with all that inventory, not knowing if it's going to work. Um, <laughs> great advice. And Michelle, again, I want to direct everybody to you. So ClearBank, clearly where people can go. What's the best yeah. site on there? Uh, just ClearBank.com? Yeah, ClearBank.com. ClearBank with a C at the end. Um, and uh, yeah, we would, we would love to hear from you. Michelle, thank you so much for joining us here on Digital Trends Live. Always nice having you on here. Great insight. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. All right, so there we go, right? We get to talk to experts all the time here on the show, and that is fantastic. That's Michelle Romano. So again, uh, clearbank.com, go there, take a look. Some great advice for people and a great way to help out your business too. All right, we've got more coming up. We've got a lot to talk about here on this show, and I do appreciate everybody who's joining in. We've got some more news updates coming up for you. We will have Drew Prindle on for Awesome Tech You Can't Buy Yet, and we're gonna be speaking to Neil Ferguson from PBS about his new documentary series. So really excited about that. All that's coming up. Stick around back here in a minute with more Digital Trends Live. Welcome back to Digital Trends Live. I'm Greg Nibbler. And again, thank you for joining us wherever you're watching. We do appreciate it. You can hit that subscribe button. We're live here every weekday, 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern. I know I say that a lot, but I really want to remind you, we'll be here bringing you tech headlines, news, interviews, and discussions. And let's get you some more news right now. So this comes from our emerging tech side of digital trends, where some interesting developments are happening. And this one has to do with artificial intelligence and some deep learning. And that is certainly one of the use cases for AI that we've seen a lot happening. So it can actually analyze so much data that's very beneficial for a number of different instances. This one has to do, though, with analyzing ancient scripts. Yes, 
archaeology. That's what we're talking about right now. So when it comes to that, uh, in particular, this is a uh, problem that is going on with some ancient uh, Persian scripts. So these are old tablets that were actually discovered in 1933. So these tablets are uh, part of the Persepolis Fortification Archive. And uh, I know there's a lot that going on there, but that's what we're looking at. So you take a look there. These ancient things, uh, these ancient tablets were made with reeds. So with this kind of script, there's a lot that goes on there. It's even 3D almost because of how deep the reed was printed in there. Problem is for humans, it takes a long, long time to try to analyze and interpret these. It's very difficult. It's a very complex ancient language. These are 25 year, 2,500 year old clay tablets. And utilizing AI in this new deep learning program that they have, they're able to analyze this much faster and actually translate what those things say. Valuable for a number of reasons. I mean, we're analyzing, again, history, trying to get an idea of what was going on at that time, what information was conveyed, and there's thousands of tablets out there that we have no idea what they say. So they took this with the, talking about the science side of things. They actually tested these tablets. They were able to translate uh, what's called cuneiform signs with an accuracy level of around 80%. That's pretty great. So 80% accurate. What that means is the rest of those, the harder ones, that's where the humans can take their time to actually analyze that and not waste their time on these things where we could translate it a lot faster. Now, if you think of that type of technology, what that could be extrapolated to, deciphering ancient tablets is obviously great, but there's all kinds of other ways that you could use AI to translate software, to translate language, to translate these things that, that really mysteries that we have where we don't understand what those said, well, now we could know. So that's, again, using, using uh, artificial intelligence for this deep learning, part of the Persepolis Fortification Archives Online Cultural and Historical Research Environment Dataset. That's a lot I just said right there, but we've got a big article about it at digitaltrends.com, so go there and take a look. All right, continuing on here with some trending news stories. Let's go to space, shall we? Uh, Starlink is the organization by SpaceX, where the goal is to envelop the entire world in satellites to provide broadband internet access to everyone. And they've been uh, really on a tear with this. They've had four launches so far, about 60 satellites per launch. And they had another one that was going to be taking place on Sunday. So far, these have gone off flawlessly, but not so much this last one. So they w did have to abort the mission before the launch, so nothing was destroyed or anything like that. Uh, but they did have to actually call it off before they went up. And that's something that... You know, as we talk about Starlink, as we talk about SpaceX and enveloping the world in global uh, satellites, we're going to need a lot of launches. So this is so much so that Elon Musk has stated they want to send one up about every 72 hours would be the goal to get all of these up there to uh, get this satellite internet available for everybody. And part of uh, this, you know, when you, when you think about it is we have to send up so many. So they could end up having as many as 30,000 satellites enveloping the Earth as part of Starlink. And that is a lot. That's a lot of satellites up there. They've been encountering some issues with astronomers who are a little bit upset about this and believe that it's going to actually block out some of the abilities of them to study space. Certainly an important issue right there. Elon Musk has some meetings planned with them, at least as far as what he has stated, to try to uh, mitigate some of those concerns, but definitely a big concern. The launches are going to continue on unabated, so we don't know exactly what happened with this one. We'll find out some more information soon, I'm quite sure. But that is something that uh, when you take a look at it, we really do need to figure out uh, how much more is going to be launched on there. There we go. So taking a look there, that is another idea of how many are going to be out there. It's just kind of a design that was actually created by a university. Um, that's just for Starlink, too, by the way. There's other companies that are working on this. Amazon's working on it. Uh, you have OneWeb working on this. So a lot of people trying to figure out how we can get more satellites up there. Broadband internet access is very important, especially right now, right? Relate it to today. A lot of us are going to be working at home. A lot of people out there that need access at home. This is something that could provide that. And in theory, on par price-wise with what's available now, but even in two rural areas, which is very important. However, a lot of issues clearly still to be worked out. But you can read more about that one at digitaltrends.com. All right, let's give you one more thing here. And this is a, kind of an interesting project that I wanted to bring to light, especially since uh, people are going to be looking for some more entertainment online. And it has to do with Apollo 13. What? Yes, not the movie, the actual launch. It's coming up on the 50-year anniversary of the Apollo 13 launch. And I believe it's April... April 10th, April 14th. I'll double check on that, what the actual date was. Uh, but the, nonetheless, the thing is this. You can now relive the exact 
process of this happening from launch to the issue, obviously, that happened with Jim Lovell and crew before they had to uh, make their emergency abandonment of that and get back to Earth. Uh, spoilers, they were successful, which is good, uh, because you can follow along with the entire thing. So from the launch itself, what they've, what they've done with this group here, and this is from NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston. They did a similar project for Apollo 11 last year. This, though, they, they retraced uh, all of the footage they could find, archival footage, the actual audio, uh, everything that happened with that, so you can follow along if you want to in real time with the launch of Apollo 13 and even cover everything that happened. You can hear the audio of them when they discover the issue. Uh, you can hear them launching just the conversations back and forth. It's really just a great moment in history to kind of relive and see what, what they went through to get to this moment where we're at. I was just talking about Starlink before, talking about SpaceX. Well, it took a lot to get there, and this is something that back then was a huge issue with when the, these three astronauts could have been lost, and they clearly weren't. Um, it's fascinating. They have 7,200 hours of audio from NASA's mission control. They have footage, they have pictures, they have videos, and it's all right there. You can skip ahead, too, to any moment in time. They wanted to put it up before the anniversary just to get everybody familiar with it, so you can already go through it and experience it right now. Uh, pretty great. So check that out. We've got a link, to at digitaltrends.com, but it's apolloinrealtime.org slash 13. I believe the Apollo 11 one is still up there as well. A uh, pretty cool use case of technology to kind of understand where we came from to get to where we are right now and maybe where we're going past that. You can check all that out at digitaltrends.com. And I thank everybody for joining us here too. We do broadcast live here every weekday, 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern. As I've said before, and I want you all to hit that subscribe button. We'll be here bringing you news and headlines every single day. But coming up next, I am very excited for our, our next guest because uh, he is not only from PBS, he's a multi, multi-time author, uh, best-selling author and from the Hoover Institution from Stanford, a Stanford University fellow, but he has Neil Ferguson's Networld, which is going to be premiering here on PBS for a three-part documentary talking about social media and the influence it, that it has on spreading misinformation. Turns out this is kind of a trend that's been happening for a lot longer than social media. We're going to cover that and more. That's coming up next, so please stick around. We'll be right back with more Digital Trends Live. Welcome back to Digital Trends Live. I'm Greg Nibbler, and thank you for joining us wherever you are. We broadcast live here every weekday, 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern, talking about tech headlines, news, and interviews, and certainly something that is discussed a lot is the prevalence of misinformation that is spread online via social networks, and how that all happens. Why is it that that goes on? Where does it all start? And, and maybe even going back into the past, when did it all begin? We've got that and so much more we're going to talk about because we have joining us right now from PBS's Neil Ferguson's Network, talking about this upcoming three-part documentary, uh, Neil, thank you so much for joining us here today. My pleasure, Greg. Great to talk to you. Um, I'm very, very excited to watch this series that you are putting out talking about this, but I want to go th through it with you and, and maybe have you give us just a description of what this three-part series is going to be about and what maybe some of the impetus was for you to want to do this. Well, I'm a historian by training, but I've always been fascinated by networks of all kinds uh, and especially social networks. And I've always felt that historians tend to underestimate their importance. And of course, in our time, giant online social networks have become obviously very important indeed for so much, uh, not only for politics, but also just look at the way uh, we're currently trying to understand 
the properties of this extraordinary uh, coronavirus and the disease COVID-19 that it causes, the amount of fake news and bad medical advice that's out there is truly staggering. And so it's a very timely series. We're all in social network, Greg. You and I belong to complex clusters of family, friends, and distant acquaintances. Very few of us really understand what that implies. And so the goal of NetWorld is to explain how social networks operate and show that they weren't invented by Mark Zuckerberg, that they've always been part of human life, and they govern the behavior of everything from politics to pandemics. I mean, there's so much that you just talked about right there that is, is fascinating to think about. Um, I want to talk about where we're at right now and what a prevalence it has. But you mentioned that this isn't something that was invented by Mark Zuckerberg. This has been a, something that's, that's maybe a human trait going back further than that. In your research, what did you find when it came to the spread of misinformation previous to social networks? Well, let me give you an example to show that uh, you, you can have very large uh, network effects without sophisticated technology. The printing press uh, in uh, a modern form came to Europe in the late 15th century. In the early 16th century, a man named Martin Luther made some radical suggestions about how to change the way the Roman Catholic Church was governed. Those ideas went viral because the printing press spread them so rapidly throughout Europe. What Luther didn't expect was that his proposals would lead to a, uh, a 130 years of religious conflict between those who agreed with him and those who disagreed with him. Uh, and so in the series, I talk about how ideas about religious reform spread, and so too did crazy ideas, and you can see some illustrations of the point here, about witchcraft. Uh, it wasn't just reasonable reform proposals that, uh, that spread through the printed press. Uh, there were also crazy ideas, uh, such as that witches live amongst us, ideas that led to thousands of people being burnt at the stake or otherwise put to death. So I guess the, the idea I'm trying to make uh, uh, intelligible here is that you don't need the internet to have fake news. You don't need sophisticated technology for all kinds of things to go viral, uh, literally and metaphorically. Is this just a human trait that we're inevitably going to do no matter what the platform is, that somebody's going to take it and spin it off? Or is there maybe some kind of actual control that you could have to keep that kind of misinformation from spreading? Well, I do think that uh, we have certain novel properties in our networks today. The, the big online networks, uh, Google uh, and Facebook and, and Twitter too, are optimized for user engagement uh, because the business model is hook your attention and then, uh, and then ads can be sent your way. The problem about that business model is that uh, we are engaged by sensational stories more than we are by uh, dreary truth. And so uh, I think a key point about our modern networks is that they're more likely to transmit fake news and extreme views uh, than the old relatively decentralized networks that arose out of geoprinting. Uh, that, that means that we have to think a lot more deeply than we have so far about how to regulate uh, the internet. Uh, in, in truth, despite all the controversy that surrounded the 2016 election, not much has really changed in the way that the big technology platforms can operate. And the main changes that have come came actually from Europe rather th than from the United States. And I try to make the argument in NetWorld that we just have to do a lot more than we've done so far uh, to create uh, some protection from uh, ma malicious actors. And I don't just mean the Russian government. There are a lot of malicious actors out there. But also to make sure that there is free speech uh, because we don't want to sacrifice that uh, in our attempt to, uh, to regulate fake news and extreme views. I mean, it is such a delicate balance, and you're mentioning, you know, with, with Russia and certainly with the, the U.S. election a few years ago, and, and elections all over the world, this happened too, where misinformation was spread. Right now, we're seeing with, you know, the advent of coronavirus, like you were talking about, there's so much misinformation that's being um, put out just immediately. You've also got malicious actors who are trying to fish people and, and put out hoaxes to get them involved. Um, do you think things like GDPR or other kinds of regulations, you mentioned, you mentioned Europe, uh, other kinds of regulations would help stem that? Or what kinds of regulations do you think should be implemented to help control that and balance free speech? 
Well, well, one of the lessons of history, and I talk about it in, in, in NetWorld, is that it's harder than it looks to bring very large near monopoly companies uh, uh, under any kind of public control. Uh, antitrust has made a comeback as an idea, but I mean, I, I actually think that the history of, uh, of the late 19th century shows how difficult it is to use antitrust. Standard Oil was broken up, but it didn't really weaken the grip. Uh, of the various companies that, that it was broken into. I think a lot of energy is probably going to be expended in rather fruitless attempts to uh, apply antitrust to, say, Google or, or Facebook or, or Amazon. I'm also somewhat skeptical of the view that you can just regulate this the way you regulate, I don't know, uh, the, um, uh, the, the highways or the railroads. Uh, regulation of railroads didn't actually have a tremendously happy outcome in the United States. It more or less killed railroads off. Uh, and so you've got to be careful and wary of those people who just say, as I'm afraid one often hears in Washington or in Brussels, oh, we can we can regulate this, leave it to the government. I mean, the government hasn't got a great record on, uh, on regulation. Just ask anyone who was involved in the financial crisis. So this is tricky. Uh, and I would say that one of the points I make in the series is let's look at Section 230. The Communications Decency Act creates remarkable legal immunities for what are now very vast companies. I think that that needs to be re-examined. And I think we probably need some kind of First Amendment for cyberspace to make sure that companies like Facebook uh, or Twitter aren't engaged in censorship uh, on the basis of their own community guidelines, which they're really able to make up as they go along. So those are the two things that I would focus on as we try to rethink how we how we regulate the Internet. Was there anything that you found in this in the research for this three part series that you used and actually analyzed your own personal online behavior? And we're like, OK, this is something that I was doing that falls along that. Or did you make any changes in association with your studies? That's a great question. I think one of the things that I've uh, learned is the great danger of following news through social media platforms. Uh, the Twitter addiction is quite common uh, with people like me, academics who have some public profile and do journalism and TV. Uh, it's easy to start to see the world through the Twitter filter. Uh, and no matter how carefully you calibrate that app, it is a very distorted picture of the world that you will get. So I think one thing that I've certainly sought to do, and I'm doing it even more aggressively during this pandemic is make sure that I'm getting my sources of news uh, from a, a wide variety of different uh, sites. Uh, you, you can't rely too much on the filters that are created by network platforms. You need to be a kind of uh, somewhat promiscuous consumer of news uh, and, and take it from multiple sources. A very good illustration of this is uh, that it's very important to make sure when you're reading about a pandemic that you're only really uh, listening to information from authoritative expert sources because uh, you really don't care uh, what uh, a uh, Hollywood personality has to say on the subject. So I think the critical thing is uh, don't be lazy in the way that you get information and always ask yourself, where is this coming from? If you're seeing it on Google, Facebook or Twitter, there's a reason that you're seeing it. And the reason is that the algorithm thinks you'll be engaged by it because other people like you already have been. Beware, handle with care. Yeah, it, just because uh, your Aunt Janet is reposting it doesn't mean that it's uh, necessarily going to be accurate information or whoever and else. Who hasn't? Who hasn't been receiving patent remedies for warding off uh, COVID-19 from people wholly unqualified to make those recommendations from sources that are entirely obscure? So you've got to really handle with care because we're now in life and death territory. Some of the stuff we talk about in the series was pretty high stakes because it had political implications, uh, and not only for the United States, but with a pandemic, with a real virus going viral, you're actually dealing with life and death. And that's why fake news really is uh, something that can be lethal, and we need to protect ourselves from it. And there is a lot of it about. Well, Neil, I can't wait to watch this uh, series. So again, um, it's going to Neil Ferguson's Net World. So it's going to be on March seventeenth, premiering on PBS. Is there anywhere that you'd like people to follow online? You know, we're talking about social media. Where should they follow Neil Ferguson at? Well, I am on uh, Twitter, uh, despite my reservations about the platform. <laughs> if used carefully and prudently, it's still a very good way of tracking some of the experts uh, in this field. I guess I've become one by applying this kind of network science to history. So 
Uh, you can follow me at, at nfergus. Uh, I've got a website, neilferguson.com, where you can read all my uh, journalism. But the most important thing this week is to make sure that you watch Neil Ferguson Networks on PBS. You don't, almost certainly don't know enough about network science to navigate a pandemic uh, successfully. Uh, so for that reason alone, I recommend viewing. So prudent, so timely, and just really important. Thank you so much for joining us here. Really, really appreciate you being on Digital Trends Live. Thanks very much, Greg. Have a great day and stay well. You too. All right. Uh, you know, I talk about how we get to talk to some really, really amazing people here on the show. That is a perfect example. So Neil Ferguson Networld uh, is going to be premiering on PBS. Watch that. So pertinent for what we're talking about right now. And I know we've got more coming up. We've got Drew Prindle is going to be joining us for Awesome Tech You Can't Buy Yet. So we'll go a little bit lighter here talking about some, some weird things that he has found on crowdfunding sites. But that's coming up next. So stick around back here in a minute with more Digital Trends Live. Hello, everyone. This is Digital Trends Live. Thanks for joining us wherever you are. I do appreciate it. We broadcast live here every weekday. Hit that subscribe button. Stop what you're doing. That's a great way to make sure that you get the notifications when we go live and to share the show. But right now, we have Drew Prindle for another edition of Awesome Tech You Can't Buy Yet. Drew at an undisclosed location right now, uh, but still here nonetheless. Drew, hello. How are you doing? I'm not doing too bad, man. How about yourself? Doing, doing good. Doing good, getting through this, but we have some cool things to talk about right now. As usual, awesome tech you can't buy yet, where Drew scours the internet looking for crowdfunding sites and campaigns that he thinks you should know about it. Uh, some of them are really cool, some of them are really strange. Uh, but let's start off with this first one. We've got the, I don't know if I'm saying this right, the Tuck Tech Eco Folding Kayak, is that right? Yeah, I don't know if that's right or wrong either. I've, Fair it's enough. one of those things, you don't hear people say these things out loud. Um, you just read them on the internet. But <laughs> yeah, basically what this thing is, is a, it's an origami kayak. So like instead of it being a fully like hard bodied kayak that you have to put on top of your car with like a roof rack, um, this thing folds down into this like super compact little form factor so you can fit it in a trunk. Um, and then when you want to use it, you just unfold it and, you know, snap a couple things in place and you've got a perfectly good kayak. That is pretty awesome, actually, because I, I mean, that's the one thing if you've ever tried kayaking. I mean, even if with some of the inflatable ones, they're huge. Uh, so how does this work? Is this plastic? Is, is this inflatable? What, what exactly is keeping it afloat? Um, it is totally plastic. There's nothing to inflate at all. Um, it works just, uh, I don't know. The typical boat buoyancy principle. <laughs> you, don't, you don't have to give me the science boat, behind it, but. <laughs> uh, it's the same way that most boats work, but yeah, <laughs> not inflatable at all. Um, the thing is, the th this is not necessarily a new idea. There's this company called Oru that has been making origami kayaks for uh, like a few years now, and they've you know been a big hit on Kickstarter. But um, the thing that's kind of special about these is, I mean, in addition to being super durable, like you just saw the guys hitting it with a hammer. 
they're also way cheaper than the Oru kayaks. And I don't know if that's because they're making it out of like a cheaper material or they have a better like manufacturing process, but um, you can get one, yeah, for 259 bucks on Kickstarter right now, which is like a third of the price of the Oru kayaks. That's pretty great. I mean, in durability, Definitely important if you're going to be taking a kayak out because that's the last place you want something to not be durable. So if you're out in the middle of the water, so show you being hit by a hammer, that's a, that's a good sign right there. So that's one of them. So that is uh, on a Kickstarter campaign. Again, you can see it at digitalfriends.com. Um, going from the kayaks, let's talk about bikes. We've got a foldable e-bike. Yeah, yeah. Um, not just any foldable e-bike either. This thing is like I, they're once again not a new idea. A folding e-bike. These have existed before in the past. But this one is like a whole different level of foldable. Like it is so compact that when you completely collapse it, it fits into like a backpack size bag. What? So instead of, yeah, like once you ride to work, instead of, you know, chaining your thing to a bike rack, you can just fold this up and take it into the office with you. Look at that. It's not even <laughs> like a full backpack size. No, he's got um, plenty of room to wear his hat yeah. and still be able to keep his, uh, keep his bike there. Um, Nice. Yeah, look at it, hipster. Let, yeah. So here's the that's thing. what I was going for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's. He's got so many B sides, bro. Anyway, um, yeah. So he's got. <laughs> so so I mean, it does look a little weird. I have to uh, admit. Yeah, a little weird. <laughs> uh, yeah. So that's the big downside here is uh, in, in exchange for having a super compact bike, you also just have to look like a complete dweeb while you ride it. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's. But it is nonetheless super, like, technologically impressive. Like, the fact that they can fit, like, an electric motor and batteries and, like, a nice little display and all of the stuff that you need for an electric bike in such a small package is impressive. That part is. The tech is definitely impressive. Did it, do you know how long the battery life was, did they say? Uh, you know, I'm not entirely sure. It does last for about 18.5 miles. Uh, okay, gotcha. It's actually pretty good. That's uh, about on par with most uh, electric skateboards these days. Would you ride this into work? Oh, hell no. <laughs> you wouldn't, I wouldn't be caught dead riding this thing. I would be far too embarrassed. Damn it. I was going to get you the hat to go along with it if you were. Yeah. But, uh, it would have to be like a little pinwheel hat. That's the only kind of hat <laughs> you can wear with this thing. <laughs> All right. Awesome tech you can't buy yet. Take a look at there at the Hebo folding e-bike. Uh, let's go to this last one here. I just all I have on my list is just compostable bags. I don't know what we're walking into. <laughs> uh, yeah, so not the most exciting thing <laughs> in the world, um, but I thought it was neat just because it's like an ongoing trend uh, for crowdfunding. There's a lot of like eco-minded, eco-friendly, reusable, recyclable campaigns uh, at any given moment, and uh, this one makes these really neat compostable bags, which. Once again, compostable bags, not a new idea, but this one does it a little bit differently. They make them out of vegetable starch and like cellulose. So they are not just like biodegradable, they are rapidly biodegradable. Like if they, as soon as they hit the ground, they'll start to like degrade and get wet and wither away within just like a couple of days. Uh, but while you're using them in your, your kitchen or whatever, um, they'll behave pretty much exactly like any other compost or any other plastic bag. The other cool thing, though, is that in addition to just, um, instead of just making one style of bag, they make every kind of plastic bag that you probably miss if you tried to go fully reusable at this point. So they make trash bags, Ziploc bags, grocery bags, sandwich bags, all of that stuff. And so instead of just buying one, you get the whole like suite of plastic stuff without the, uh, the guilt. Well, that, that's a campaign I can get behind. That's pretty cool. So again, that's the compostable bag. So that's part of uh, Awesome Tech You Can't Buy Yet, where Drew Prindle has scoured the internet to find these things for you. And there's more too. We've always got the list up and, and more articles about it at digitaltrends.com. Uh, Drew, as always, I want to say thank you. Uh, stay safe and comfortable wherever you are right there in your undisclosed location. And uh, we'll be talking to you more here on Digital Trends Live. Thanks for having me. All right, Drew Prindle, check out Awesome Tech You Can't Buy Yet again right there on the site. So he's got all kinds of different things for you to take a look at for awesome tech you can't buy yet. And I want to say thank you to everybody who's been joining us here for Digital Trends Live. We've had a lot that we've been covering today. And I want to thank everybody who's maybe a newer viewer who's been joining us on whatever platform you're on. Uh, certainly hit that subscribe button. That is a great way to actually follow along with what we're doing. Tomorrow on the show, we'll have Julian Hearn, the chief marketing officer and founder of the nutrition company, Huel, who'll be joining the show uh, to look at ways to minimize the environmental impact of products. Huel's 
made it their mission to create affordable, convenient food that's animal and environmentally friendly. Also joining us, Mark Lawrence, the co-founder and CEO of Spot Hero. So Spot Hero is like the Airbnb of parking spots. So the app lets owners of off-street parking spots sublet their spaces. So they now have over 7,000 locations in over 300 cities connected on the app. And we'll have all of that plus the breaking technology news of the day as we always do. So thanks for tuning in. We'll be back live at 9 a.m. Pacific noon Eastern wherever you consume content. Hit that subscribe button and follow us to get notified whenever we go live each day. For Digital Trends, I'm Greg Nibbler and I'll see you right back here tomorrow.